peace of Christ be with you. This is the Midweek Reflection for Third Reformed on June 3rd, 2020. And on this date, I made my way into work this morning from my house on the west side of the city by driving through downtown, where I saw the city center closed off to car traffic with municipal plows and dump trucks blocking off all of the intersections. I saw the boarded up windows, the last remnants of graffiti to be scrubbed away, the char marks on the pavement, where police cars and dumpsters had burned on Saturday night. And seeing that this morning and watching that unfold over the weekend is hard for somebody who loves Grand Rapids. I'm sure it was hard for you too. And it made me think about when I first moved to the west side of GR 20 years ago. For a kid like me who had grown up in a rural community in Oceana County, That move brought with it exposure to relationships and realities that I really had not known before. And it was during that period, and in large part because of those experiences, that I began to discern a call to pastoral ministry. When I was deciding whether to go to seminary or not, a series of connections brought me in relationship with Bruce Menning, a man who's become a trusted friend and colleague in the years since. Bruce is now a retired minister in the Reformed Church of America, the RCA. But at the time, he was working for the denomination in global missions and had previously served in areas of urban ministry. That first time that we met over breakfast, I asked Bruce about the RCA's response in West Michigan during the civil rights era of the late 60s and early 70s a time that predated my life, but that I was coming to understand held deep significance for our national identity. And I remember him saying that to really understand that, I had to go back further and first consider the decades of suburbanization and redlining housing policies that led up to that period. He said during that time, the RCA had largely followed where our people went meaning the largely white, middle-class, often Dutch immigrant communities that formed the backbone of the RCA. And that because of that, our churches had become increasingly isolated and insulated from the struggles and realities of the increasingly segregated and impoverished black communities that we lived alongside of. So that when the civil rights movement began to gain steam, The issues that it was struggling with were ones that very few people had personal connection and relationship to. So that in his experience, our churches largely remained silent about the struggle that was underway and boiling over around the country. Or when they did talk about it, it was often to reinforce the narrative of the inherently dangerous and often violent urban centers or to talk about the lawlessness of those who were rioting out of their pain. But that the church rarely named or really wrestled with the underlying pervasive sin of racism that had been the catalyst behind it all. Now, I didn't live through that season. I would love to hear from those of you who did if your experience was something different than what Bruce shared. But I remember being really struck as a young man by hearing his account of that, feeling like throughout that time and certainly in the climax of that tension in 1968, the church had largely missed an opportunity to be a voice for justice, for reconciliation, and for peace when the nation badly needed it. Now, any parallels between what we're going through now and 1968 are certainly out of balance right now. That year, which coincidentally was when Third Reform moved to our home here at Michigan and Lakeside, brought with it an unprecedented level of turmoil. As the Vietnam War hit a crucial point in the turn of public opinion and the loss of life as political processes were tossed upside down, and especially with the assassinations of King and Kennedy and the widespread rioting and violence and loss of civilian life. That year was one 
like no other. And yet there's enough parallels that I hear people mentioning it in the experience that we've been seeing over the last week. And it's hard to escape the sense that we are living in a moment of historic significance right now. As we look at the global pandemic and the disruption it's caused to our lives and economies, and as this deep, painful wound of racism in our nation has once again been drawn to the surface, and we see protests and even rioting once again in the streets, I can't help but feel like sometime decades down the road, I'm going to find myself talking to some potential new young pastor and answering questions about what happened in 2020 and how the church showed up in the midst of that. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I really hope that I can be proud of the answers that I give when we look back on this season. For many of us, the realities that black Americans are naming, lifting back up into our awareness right now, are ones that we don't have personal connection to. That's not true for everybody, but it's certainly true for many of us. And part of the privilege that somebody like myself has had throughout my life is not having to think about those issues or wrestle with what's underlying all of it. But I'm convinced that the church is at its best when we speak up as a voice for justice and reconciliation and peace in the moments when our communities need it. I'm also convinced that issues of racism are not political issues, but they are issues that are at the heart of the story of scripture in the gospel message itself. From the very beginnings of scripture when we are told that all people, male and female, are created in the image of God and bear with it that divine dignity that deserves respect, to the angelic message at the birth of Jesus that his coming brought with it good news of great joy for all people, to the apostle Peter in Caesarea acknowledging in the coming of the Holy Spirit on those who had not previously been a part of God's story that he now understood that God truly shows no partiality to the words of the Apostle Paul written repeatedly to the churches he cared about, affirming that there is no more male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, but that all are one in the hope that Christ came to bring and in the reconciling love of God that he gave the fullest expression of. So in this moment, as we're trying to come to grips with what it is we are experiencing as a community and as a nation, I encourage you to think about how you want to be remembered as showing up in this crucial time in our national history. What kind of voice do you want to have? What kind of openness are you willing to show, to learn, to engage, and to not remain isolated from the pain that we are bearing witness to right now? I am so grateful to serve a congregation that in my experience has shown courage with being willing to step in to difficult conversations, even when that's just to acknowledge that we don't know what we don't know, but that we want to. And so I encourage you, once again, to engage with me. You can respond in the comments here on this video, and now that we've moved into stage four in the Safe Start plan, you can come find me in person. If you want to do some more exploring, learning, and wondering about how we can keep growing and keep showing up as a voice for hope in a time when our community needs it.